This is the pinnacle of engineering, a doomsday submarine designed to survive the end of the world and deliver the final retaliatory strike. But for the crew inside, it's a trap with no escape. What happens after the world outside vanishes and the final launch button is pushed? To understand this terrifying design, we must return to a moment when one person was already standing on the brink. September 26th, 1983. The Serpikov 15 bunker near Moscow, Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov is watching the early warning system screen. Suddenly, the word launch flashes. The system reports that the United States has launched one then four more intercontinental ballistic missiles. The protocol was clear. Report immediately to the high command, which would mean triggering a massive retaliatory strike. But Petrov broke protocol, trusting his intuition that a real attack would be massive, not just five missiles. He reported a system malfunction. He was right. It was a false alarm. One man with access to the data prevented a nuclear war. This incident reveals a terrifying vulnerability. So what happens when the decision must be made by people completely cut off from all data deep beneath the ocean? To solve this problem, an answer was created. The Nuclear-Powered Ballistic Missile Submarine, or SSBN. An invisible, invulnerable arc, the ultimate guarantor of retaliation. But the real hidden drama lies with the crew, because if they fulfill their mission, the very technology that ensures their survival will become their most cruel psychological prison. We are not just talking about a weapon, we are talking about a fatal logic of design that turns physical salvation into a slow, existential decay. To understand the paradox, we must first acknowledge their strength. Modern SSBNs are not just ships, they are underwater fortresses. Take the American Ohio class, 170 meters long, displacing nearly 19,000 tons, with each boat carrying up to 24 Trident 2D5 missiles armed with multiple warheads. This is the power to destroy targets over 4,000 nautical miles away. Technological perfection is only half the story. The other half is the people. SSBN crews undergo an exceptionally rigorous selection process. It's not just a test of physical endurance, but a deep psychological evaluation. They must demonstrate optimism, high social cohesion, and a complete lack of conflict-prone tendencies. So, these elite operators are selected not just to withstand stress, but to psychologically accept their one-way mission. Their job is to ensure the end of the world if deterrence fails. They are the final messiahs whose salvation is meant for their nation, not for themselves. This very normalization, the idea that their personal futures are implicitly subordinate to the mission's completion, is the first cruel aspect of this system's paradox. The strategy offloads the ultimate existential cost onto an isolated group, allowing the rest of society to live in an illusion of safety. But if the world truly ends, what becomes of its last soldiers? From an engineering standpoint, an SSBN is a masterpiece of survival. Its nuclear reactors provide virtually unlimited energy, allowing the submarine to stay submerged for months, even years. This energy is used to electrolyze seawater for oxygen and distill it for fresh water. The life support systems are designed for long duration operations. But here we face the first and simplest paradox. A nuclear submarine can operate for 30 years without refueling, but its human inhabitants are limited by their finite food supplies. A typical patrol carries only enough for about three months. The physical arc can sail for decades, so its inhabitants are doomed to a slow starvation. This dilemma of survival is only deepened by the environment. Prolonged submersion disrupts natural cycles, isolating the crew from sunlight and the outside world. This condition has an unofficial but fitting name among submariners, the sickness of the deep. 
It's an informal term for a spectrum of psychological disorders, from depression and apathy to paranoia and aggressive outbursts, all caused by the confined, monotonous environment. The very monotony and confinement, essential for stealth, turn the submarine into a psychological pressure cooker. The absence of natural cues, the constant need to avoid conflict in an overcrowded space, and the stress of long separation from family, it all creates a colossal mental burden. And this is where the hidden cruelty of their design is revealed. The incredible systems built for physical survival simultaneously prolong the exposure to these intense psychological stresses, turning the boat into a hermetically sealed prison. To understand how dangerous an information vacuum is, we don't need to imagine anything. We only need to remember October 27th, 1962, at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Soviet submarine B-59, armed with a nuclear-tipped torpedo, was surrounded by American destroyers. They were dropping signaling depth charges, but the crew of B-59 was cut off from Moscow. They didn't know the charges were signals, not an attack. Captain Savitsky, believing the war had already started, ordered the nuclear torpedo to be readied for launch. Firing required the consent of three senior officers. Two agreed, so the world was saved from nuclear war by one man, Vasily Arkhipov, who refused to give his consent. This incident proves that in an information vacuum, even the most resilient professional will push to the brink of catastrophic decisions. Now, imagine a total communication breakdown after an EMP strike. The air is dead. No radio, no GPS. What happens next? The answer to that question is an official confirmation of our theory, and it lies in real-world protocols. Britain's letters of last resort are sealed envelopes containing orders for submarine commanders. Russia's dead hand system is a semi-automated doctrine of retaliation. But analyze these protocols. They focus exclusively on the act of retaliation. They contain no instructions for the crew's long-term survival, their reintegration into society society or any effort to rebuild. There is no reconstruction protocol or return protocol. This is the second and even more fatal paradox, a mental landscape of utter hopelessness. The same isolation that makes the SSBN survivable, combined with a collapse of communication, turns its physical safety into a psychological trap. Their survival becomes a cruel joke, physically unharmed but mentally adrift in a world that no longer exists. The architects of nuclear deterrence meticulously planned how to execute global destruction and retaliation, but they largely ignored what comes next for the very individuals tasked with carrying out that final act. The final, most brutal paradox is this. The crew, the most psychologically resilient and highly skilled individuals, are doomed by design to a state of complete purposelessness. They have done their duty, they have ended the world, and now they are left to drift without a goal. The submarine, a technological marvel of strategic deterrence, is not a self-sustaining human ecosystem. Its design effectively creates the illusion of a safe haven from immediate destruction, but offers no possibility of return, recovery, or even contact. This renders their continued existence meaningless. They have survived the physical catastrophe, but they will not survive the existential one. We see that the relentless pursuit of absolute deterrence in achieving its strategic goal has unintentionally created a hidden, profound human tragedy. The SSBN, the ultimate guarantor of peace through mutual destruction, becomes a silent, floating tomb for its living occupants. The silence of the deep becomes the silence of a future that will never come for them. This is the final, most tragic aspect of its design.